everybody, welcome to Let's Talk Assassin's Creed, your number one podcast for all things Assassin's Creed. Now this is the part of the show where James usually does his pretty awesome intros. He will give us the episode number, which I don't actually have on me, so I'm already failing today. Sadly, James isn't able to work with us just for today. Um, I don't want to say why, because it's not my business, so he's not with us today, but he should be back to fit and healthy next week with our good work of podcasting. So, as I put on Twitter today, this episode is like behind the scenes, a little bit of sneak peek of what's going on and essentially what's in the thought process behind the show lately. Now, we do have the elephant in the room to address, and I can't say much, because, well, I can't say much. <laughs> Very odd, I know. But I know you are all eager for the Dalian McDevitt episode. It's the elephant in the room. Sadly, we can't give you any updates on when that episode is coming just yet. But patience shall be rewarded. And hopefully you will enjoy it as much as we enjoyed recording it. Darby was so fantastic to work with. He was really a blast. You know, it was everything... I wanted more from meeting Darby, you know, it's a surreal moment to be a podcaster, to then be able to meet someone who writes and works on Assassin's Creed, it's wild. So, behind the scenes, what's going on with Let's Talk? So, we have a problem, not a major problem, that's a worry about the show, but until we can know when we can publish the Darby episode. We don't know when we can publish episodes. It's very it's a wild one. So next week we have a very good guest who's welcome to the show to do a series of topics that I would like to start that I've been ignoring and I'll explain more in a minute and some more problems I'm having with the franchise and what I want to see in the future. And we're gonna get that out next week. But there will be no promotion for the episode. Now, I know it's really bad that I'm not promoting, but the reason why I'm not promoting is if we can release that Davy episode, we will. Let, we don't want to promote, like, hey, we're doing this episode next week with this guest, we're going to talk this. And then last minute, to you guys, listeners, pull the rug out from the feet and say, actually, no, we're doing this Davy episode instead. So I spoke to the guest, and the guest does know that if we can release it afterwards, we'll release theirs the next week. If not, theirs will go ahead. So we're not going to do much promotion now until probably the Friday before. This is just because we don't want to overexcite you on an episode that sounds interesting. Um, And then for us to say, actually, we're going to do it another time for the Derby. I know pretty much everyone listening, like, but it's it's Derby. We'll be excited, you know, to listen to the Derby. But I just like to make sure that any new time listeners that may join for that one specific episode are just not disappointed that it's not coming out. So there is some behind the scenes, some the nitty gritty of life as a podcaster. It's and it's kind of strange doing the solo. I will admit. <laughs> so. Where to with Assassin's Creed? That's that's what I want to talk to and what we'll discuss with James. Where to with Assassin's Creed? So, the mythology arc. I can talk for days and days and days and days about mythology, but I'm not going to anymore. We have two scheduled mythology podcasts, some very good ones, and other than a couple of things I want to discuss about the mythology trilogy, uh, mythology arcs of Valhalla today, I'm really excited to move on to Templar-based topics. Because Templars are something that I've wanted to explore in the Assassin's Creed franchise more deeper than anything, because they are portrayed as the enemy. But we not really see much of the grey area they can operate in. You know, there's the old philosophical question or of um, you're on a tram, run down uh, tracks, there's one person on the tracks, or there's ten another, which track do you pick, because you're going to hit one of them. It's that, like, moral philosophy that I would like to explore with a Templar, you know. 
does the Templar's dictatorship or its order mean that one or two peoples are going to suffer, but there'd be thousands of it going to thrive? So does the the need of one outweigh the need of many? That sort of false question. And I think when you play an Assassin's Creed game as an assassin, you don't get to look at that fairly because an assassin's ideology is kill the Templars for freedom, and it's very respectable ideology of the series, and it's very respectable ideology that we've known for years through the Assassin's Templars. But it'd be nice to play it as a Templar and see it from the angle you know, have enemies where there are assassins hunting you and they're coming out the shadows, and you get to see that a Templar has this choice where from the outset you look like the bad guy, you know, you're going to ruin maybe a hundred people's lives by, let's say, destroying all these homes to build, I don't know, let's say a factory. I was going to say factory, because first of all, the assassins will see the factory as a bad thing, probably, because it may involve um, cheap labour, or it may, like, because a hundred people have been homeless. I, I am thinking, mainly in my head, of, like, this a syndicate scenario, because I've just read on the world. But in the Templar's eyes, them hundred people... I got on the home, yes, but this new factory could power electricity for a million people. As an assassin, you wouldn't see that. You would see, in my opinion, you know, hundred homes lost. They're trying to control this area. They're trying to stamp it out. They're trying to put their mark like a dictatorship, but they're not. They're trying to help. So it, it's a philosophy, and there's a lot more I don't know about the Templars because the games do focus heavily on the assassins, but there is Templar comics I have not read. So after this year, I there is a lot more that came in the spotlights because they're one of my favorite projects to do that James suggested, you know, getting you guys on board to come do community spotlights. It's brilliant. You teach me new things and a lot of time I go back to the community, hunting for the work to follow, to enjoy as well. So other than that, I do want to do a little bit more, less mythology, but more Templars and more Assassin stuff, because there's a lot of stuff that I want to nitpick. And there is a lot of other wild stuff I want to discuss as well, but I'm not going to spoil the secret sauce of the show today. That's... Too, how do I word it? That's too kind of me to do, <laughs> to do that, to give you everything. So, there is a big mythology elephant in the room that I don't have a platform to discuss until today because this is basically a last minute episode to give you guys content for this week because we did have an episode planned for this week that we couldn't do, sadly. So, I'm going to use this platform to give you my thoughts on the two biggest mythology issues I'm having with Valhalla, and this is probably the last time I'm going to discuss them unless you guys want to reach out to me about it. So the first one is the Asgard Ark. Now the Asgard Ark is, you know, you know what, a ton of fun, and it's one of my favourite arcs out there. But when it starts and, you know, you have the non sisters and you're on the throne and you're talking and it tells about your fate and what you've got to do, and then boom, you're doing the Asgard arc. Great. But there is a story in Norse mythology where Odin hangs himself from the roots of Yig- from the branches of Yggdrasil for nine days to learn forbidden knowledge, I believe. And I really, hand on heart, think something like this should have been explored before the Asgard Ark, or at the very start, because we know the Drizzle device, which is what Basim falls out of, allows well, Basim to see simulations with the reader. It would, in my opinion, make a lot of sense and depth to Odin's back, well, Harvey's backstory, if we saw Harvey before he finds the final seventh solution in the Drizzle device watching the simulation, and he watches a simulation of Loki's Rebellion of Health, which I'll get onto in a minute. And then, you know, you do the Asgard and the Jotunheim arcs, and you realise that the Norn sisters were Isu that, you know, studied the simulations, you know, trying, they're the ones that are trying to help 
the capsule triad prevents the total catastrophe by checking the simulations. And we could then, in my opinion, interpret they're trying to warn Harvey that it, just because you saw something in the simulation doesn't mean it's going to happen. A simulation is probably one in a hundred possibilities. But with Harvey being Harvey, he does try and prevent this from happening, his fate, and that's what we see from the cultural lens. And then you could then interpret it in a more stronger Isu sense that everything he does in the Asgard and Northern Time arcs is because he sees a revolution. He doesn't see the Toba catastrophe because that's not what Ragnarok is. Ragnarok is the battle of the gods. There is a final part where all the gods die and Sutra cleanses the Nine Realms of Fire. Uh, the small issue I have thought of Ragnarok. <laughs> but it essentially is a battleground of the gods. Odin fights Fenrir and dies. Thor fights Jormunda and dies. Loki f- fights Hamdal and dies. Basically, all the gods die. But it would have been a unique opportunity in them Asgard and Yosemite arcs to see that this is why Harvey distrusts Loki. This is why Harvey wants to trap Fenrir. Because in the simulation, he saw the Isu son, Fenrir, basically defending a point in the heart, basically fighting Harvey, and Harvey doesn't want that. He doesn't want Loki's children to attack us. He knows, we know from a letter found in the Jotunheim arc, that Odin's already has his, Loki's children in prison. The serpent, Jormunder, held his daughter and Fenrir the wolf. You know, they've been imprisoned and took to him. And as we saw in the Asgard arc, there's a wolf and you find him. So there is a bit more nuance to how the Asgard arcs and how the wolf failure plays out, but it still would make a lot of ma- metaphorical sense that he sees Fenrir in the situation and he then sees child Fenrir with Loki and he recognizes the child from his dreams and he's like, no, 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 this is not happening. This child needs to be taken away from Loki before the simulation, and I'm using child not in the term of like, like teenager, like I'm probably going to say I don't, because I don't know how Isu age works, you know, to them a 20 year old could be, they could live to like 150 and a 20 year old could be a child, <laughs> so I'm going to say safe bet that the person's probably 18 at the, when he first finds him, and then he tries to imprison him, then maybe the kid rebels and fights. It's the first time we're Fenrir. The kid's now probably going to say about 20. So two years have passed, maybe briefly. Time's different when you look at simulations. So they, that's the first fight you have. And as he goes to kill him, that's when Lucas, hey, that's my son. That Isu is my son. And that's when Harvey will start to fit things in place. That he saw this person in his simulation killing him in a civil war and now it's come to light that it's Loki's son Loki must be responsible for the civil war so all Asgard and Yodunheim act to happen blah 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 we cut to Dag Ragnarok now in the DLC it's told that Loki has been bind not captured but we don't know how but now if we know about him being in Yggdrasil for nine days so I'm going to interpret it as nine simulations. And he finds a simulation of an Isu civil war. Fenrir is the one that's going to kill him. This Isu Fenrir. He now knows that the Isu Fenrir is Loki's son. So he imprisons Loki because he thinks he's Loki's conspiring with his child. That fits, in my opinion. And as I've already explained with Dolan Ragnarok, this is where my biggest issue ties. Dolan Ragnarok is Battle of the Gods. I expected and hoped... The DLC would follow Loki's daughter Hel, who in the myth is the one that is holding Balder captive. She is the one that tasks the Aesir messenger to ask every living creature to weep for Balder and they can have Balder back. But no, that's not what happens. Loki refuses to cry for Balder and Balder is kept with Hel. Then at Ragnarok, Hel leads an army multiple times against the Aesir, and they all fight. It's a big civil war. And as we know in the truth video, as the Tobacco Test hit, they leave with the weapons drawn. This could be symbolic. Of, you know, we're not going about our weapons arms into the next life. 
or you could interpret it at the very end of it all that what's going on is actually the civil, the final breath of the civil war and it would mean that Odin's fate was caused by Odin himself that would be so in my opinion a, such a good loop that to avoid fate Odin creates his own fate I think that niche would work if you played Dawn of Ragnarok and even if there was a little bit of alluding no anomalies this is not just alluding having a story centered around hell holding Bolden captive and them two fighting and the final scene is them two fighting and a character of the god's name attacking Sutra and dies in my opinion should be represented as the first casualty of the solar flare because in the Norse myth Suter raises his fire sword and cleanses the nine realms of fire. If that's not solar flare, I don't know what is. So making that in Isu is a little bit on the nose in my opinion. I'm, but at the same time, I'm not trying to knock the DLC because on the flip side, what they did with the DLC, the story they told, the world they built, the combat system worked brilliantly. I really, I do have some Isu issues, as I just explained a little bit, and a story direction I would have preferred to see, but I'm not going to sit here and say, diss the DLC, because I'm having so much fun playing the DLC, and I really think what they've built is pretty perfect for what they were trying to achieve, but I do think the whole mythology could have promoted a bit more if... They had this whole system of um, Odin finding the simulation, not understanding the simulation. Then the Asgard and the Jotunheim is basically him trying to trick the simulation. I'm going to die, so I'm going to find the seventh method. But I think we've interpreted it as he's going to die from the solar flare. But what if he wasn't going after the solar flare, but he just wanted to cheat the, sim the civil war? And in finding that set, it's why he only gives the select few the me the seventh method for Victor Zol because he's not going to help everyone. This is a war. He's helping him and his closest. Even Tyr, who he betrayed, he's going to help them. And I think that's quite fascinating. That would have worked kind of cool. One-to-one -one issue. I won't lie. One-to-one Isu Tartemith isn't right. 60-40, about right. But I do really think there was that little tweak of myth I would have wouldn't have minded seeing added just to give a bit more depth to Harvey that he's not just some selfish person on a rampage, but he's scared. Like, I'm not justifying his actions, but he saw a simulation where he died and he is scared. So everything he's doing out is an inert fear of death and loneliness. And fear itself, that in her fear of dying. And it's poetic that to avoid fate, Odin creates fate. And in my opinion, that would have just been perfect. Just on a personal level. And on an Isu level, we know that the humans and the Isu have, were fighting for 10 years about the total catastrophe. Would it really be a stretch to say that Odin himself caused an internal civil war between the northern clan because I have heard descriptions that there's the European clan which is like the European pantheon of Greek and Roman gods so Juno, Juno Minerva and Saturn and I know that makes the capital triad and then I think there was mention of an African type clan with like the gods that we see in Origins so Sobek, Anubis, Aminet and then you have the Northern tribe, which would be the Northern Norse gods mixed in. Gaelic gods, I would assume, because a lot of Gaelic gods do take roots in Norse myth from what I've researched, but I didn't research heavily. So an internal strife between the Northern clan at the very edge of the apocalypse, well, so far, isn't a stretch, in my opinion, because the triad was trying to prevent it. But when you watch the... Solar Flare's um, 
cutscene from the older games, everyone's just doing, they used to be doing their own thing. You know, they just walk through the street and like, oh look, that's an Aurora Balleralis. And then everything starts collapsing and failing. So I really think a lot of them didn't know about the Soul Flare and were just fighting internally over anything, really. But that's mainly my biggest problems with the myth. But hey, I've got a couple more myth episodes up my sleeve. But as I did discuss on Twitter, the nature behind this episode and everything, I am want to more talk about the future a little bit. Because the future is looking bright. Now, the I'm not going to touch the Sasquatch Infinity because... Frankly, Infinity stresses the heck out of me. I just really disagree with Ubisoft's stance of releasing it like, hey, this is Infinity. What we're doing? We don't know. When will we know? We don't know. Development's up in the air. We'll let you know soon. <laughs> so, I'm not going to touch on Infinity because that thing's driving me crazy. So, now the mythology arc is finished, where to for the franchise? Again, a new saga. You know, we had the um, Desmond saga, AC1, Ezio Trilogy, AC3. Then we have, you know, the Initius saga, I would assume, but I know it's not. Um, saga, I, I had a chat with Six Keys, and she's the best person to put it in. If I can find the message. Here we go. Black Flag Rogue Unit is to get four games, not three. Black Flag Rogue and Ace 3 are together as the Kenway Saga or the American Trilogy. Then there's Desmond Trilogy, which we all know. And then Unit and Syndicate are the Duology. And then you get the Mythology Trilogy. So they're all in pairs. So what's the next pair? Templars. I am going to defend that Templars would be next. It's the most logical choice is to do Templars next because there's a lot of Templar lore that we just don't really know. But the problem is Templars are painted in a really, really black and white bad guy light. And do you blame them? Oh no. The way the Borges act, you could tell that they were just typical evil but not all of them are going to be typically evil a lot of them may actually try their best to change people's lives but may have to risk a few other lives to do that you know the needs of few outweigh the needs of the many it's a philosophical question that's impossible to say what's right or wrong but it opens a gray area for the the Templars to fit in and play with and there is a idea that I thought of on Twitter again I'm referencing a lot of Twitter it's Rogue 2.0 Templar abandons the order to join the Creed why would that work easy we could argue, we could see a basically a Templar have a certain order, and maybe the way the Templars have run this town, this city, this area, has flown under the Assassin's radar, because they're not doing anything bad, they're just there, quietly living a life in the shadows, and maybe a guy, you know, gets up, or a girl, or any leader gets up one day, to be honest, and basically protests that the order is doing something wrong, and creates a more tyrannical, aggressive ter um, Templar order that pushes this Templar away from what he knows and loves. And it would be a great platform for you to see the Templar look at the tenants. How does the three tenants differ differentiate from the, from the order itself? How do you teach a Templar who's just all about order to save the player from the innocent? hide in plain sight, to never compromise the Brotherhood, 
already they failed to compromise the Brotherhood because they're compromising the Templar Order. So there's that philosophical debate right there if that if they basically compromise their own brothers in the Order, then they'll never be a true assassin because they're breaking the Order. But the needs of one outweigh the needs of many. And there could be 20 Templars in this circle. They need to go to save the lives of everybody else. And back to that philosophical question of the needs of few outweigh the needs of many. The few Templars that are going on this tyrannical rampage that are going to ruin a thriving city need to go. So you need to compromise your brotherhood, the Templars, to save lives. So you're breaking the third tenant to save lives. It's like it's a weird philosophical debate to spin your head around, but essentially it could open the doors just how it did with Cher Carmack. That threw open the doors that we believe the assassins to be inherently the good guys, but t- they risked so many innocent lives to get a piece of Eden, and it didn't work. That's the thing, it didn't work. So many p- lives were lost. Because of a piece of Eden. And that pushed Shay away. So why not see it from the other side? If we see it from the other side. It could be pretty interesting. And could open the doors to more law to follow. And that's the key point. More law to follow. And, hey, I'm here for Temple of Law. I don't think there's enough of it. <laughs> I really think this this series is stagnant for Temple of Law. You know. All we know is Templar law from the assassin's point of view. What if we learn assassin law from a Templar point of view? And really spin things on the head. We see Altair, Ezio, Connor. They're the heroes. What if they were the bad guys? I'm not asking what if. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying what if from the Templar's point of view. Your actions are making things worse. It's the whole... Syndicate is a really good one. It's a a philosophical debate I've had playing Syndicate myself. When I did play it. That it is right for Evie and Jacob to liberate the factories. 100% that is right. Because child labour is wrong. But on the flip side... If they take the workers out of the factories, nobody goes in the factories, factories shut down, the economy in London falls. So to the Templars, the assassins saving a few people is bad because the economy could fall down. I'm not being realistic here, because realistically that probably wouldn't happen. So this is just me probably over-exaggerating a situation. So you see that flip side that what the assassins are doing is inherently good. You have to, you cannot allow people to work in them conditions, you have to set them free. Bear in mind, in some of the places you liberate, there's like four or five Templar guards guarding them while at work. That's not fair, in my opinion, that's not nice. They should be working consensually and having fun, not big, burly, muscly men like, work. So, inherently, temp- assassin's actions, good. Templar point of view, they're bad. So... It is an angle to look at, in my opinion. Sorry, I'll start with my voice then. I think it's been so long doing the podcast with James that when James is talking and asking questions, I can rest my voice. But I've talked 29 minutes straight of non- absolute nonsense. <laughs> so, let's get back to some behind the scenes. Just some fun. I would love to pull up my Google Drive system and tell you all the plans, but I'm not going to. I know it's a tease and evil, but we work in the dark to serve the light. So a lot of our podcasts are hidden, but this is something about the podcast that is interesting. We have scheduled from today about one two, three, four, five, six, I am in drive by the way, seven, eight, nine, about ten episodes from now to April, but they're not set in stone, 
this is the very interesting thing about me and James. They're never going to be set in stone because you guys and girls of the community, you drive the show. If we had next week an episode to talk about Bats of Assassin's Creed and if Batman would be an assassin, for example, but you, the community, said, hang on a minute, can I come on your show to talk about Templars? I've got a theory that I'd like to share. We would happily accommodate that ideology. We'd be like, yeah, sure. We can postpone the episode or we can do it some more. And behind the scenes, this is what we want to keep driving for for the next few years. You, the listeners, are not just the lifeblood of the show because we listen every week. No, you guys actually are the ones that keep the passion going and if you do have an idea you want to talk about or a topic you really think should be discussed we will happily accommodate it we have a few guests and a few people we've talked to that we'll happily bring on the show and another behind the scenes thing for you as well is that Q&A Spotlights is going to only get bigger. But we need your help. And what I mean by we need your help is we want to spotlight you, the community. If you are a fan art, if you do fan art, fan fiction, run a Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr page, you're more than welcome to come on board. (laughs) You don't have to be a big... 10,000 subscribed YouTuber. You could be a YouTuber who's just started with a couple hundred listeners. If you have got something to say or you would like to join the community spotlight, we'll more than happily look into accommodating it. You know, we've always strived that the community will drive the show because I'm not being rude. I have so many wild ideas that I could probably go on a bender for hours about mythology and Assassin's Creed, which would be kind of weird to discuss. And I really wouldn't want to bore you guys with so many fan theories and fan stuff about mythology when it shouldn't be one-to-one. It shouldn't rely and it shouldn't be used to cover Isu law. It should be a way to explain Isu law through cultural lens, how humans will see the Isu. So going forward, we do want to do more Templar and more assassin stuff and we will like you the community to come on board and help with that. And if you guys do want to know what's behind the scenes and I think I found what I was looking for because I kind of lost it. Let me share you a couple of topic ideas. They're not set in stone and they're not being recorded yet. But if you guys are interested in any of these, please reach out. So uh, one topic I've had for a while and I've never explained or expand on is End of Assassin's Creed. How will the franchise end? I have the running joke that the very last game would you would do the final mission, you would do everything, and if, and you would. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna use Rebecca because she's the only character I know. Rebecca may get out the animus. She saw her ancestor, and I don't think she does have any ancestors that were assassins. So just, I'm running with a random tangent here, but she comes out the anima explains everything and maybe they say we can't stop the solar flare then the world turns to black and an isu wakes up in a sort of the drizzle style animus device and like look we have just spent years through five lives through desmond's life through the initiate's life through layla hassan's life through whoever's next life they were never able to find the answer. We are doomed forever. The game just ends. Just a massive, just, ha, 
you were playing a simulation and you were playing a simulation of a simulation. All this time it's just been an issue watching everything unfold. It's mad, but I am kind of intrigued how AC will end. So if you would like to come on board for that, why not? It'd be great. Um we've also um I'm kinda of see what else there is. Uh in game currency. Let's talk about in game currency. There's a lot of currency systems in these games and Unity has a lot. So it would be interesting to have a conversation on how they could balance in game currencies more often. Um let's see, what else can I find? Now we were did have year two Valhalla content, what do we know and what do we suspect planned? But do we really need to talk about that? <laughs> year, year two seems to be up in the air. So if you do want to talk about what could we say, I really don't think we could say no to that. You know, it is up in the air, so maybe. Um. Oh, one James shared. I remember this one. A, a desert, AC Desert Island disc style. Um, so it's based on a BBC for radio program. Each guest is cast away to a desert island. They're given the choice of the complete works of Shakespeare, a religious or fossil text of their choice, a luxury item. They must then choose what game and device they take with them, console, PC, handheld, etc. And what free AC games are they taking? To be honest, this sounds one we could just have a great laugh on. Literally, I think this would be hilarious if we did this. You know, Desert Island, what are we taking? What would we play it? It could be a good way to see, you know, some make commands that, yeah, I played Assassin's Creed 2, the first AC game, but if I'm trapped on an island, I may want to play Unity f for a long time. It's kind of cool. You know, you get to see um, different mechanics and what people's thought process are. There's a character deep dive, but I'm not going to spoil that because I'm evil. Um, one more I think I could spoil that's in the topic idea is you'd be surprised how many I had here. Hmm, what could I drag up? Hmm. I'm trying to say that we've got a lot. I think me and James never seem to stop sparring ideas. Um, how about a really nice one? No, I can't find it. <laughs> I just, I don't know. So why don't we leave this last idea to be something you guys choose. And we can look into it. As always, the guest is always right. I think that's how it goes. <laughs> so I know today's been a very up in the air type of episode. And we do try our hardest to have episodes planned that are more structured, more fluid. But this time we are kind of a loop. We did actually hope to have Derby published this week, but we didn't. And so this has for a loop where today, as of Friday the 18th, we're like scrambling for content for you guys because I'm addicted to making podcasts. That's the truth. And I love sharing ideas with you, the listeners. So I apologize for the random waffle of topics today, but. I just really want to have a nice little chat, casual, with no format, just to get you guys familiar with the show's working, my thoughts on the myth arcs and games, and just why I want Templars in the next game. And also, the last thing, I do really want to, you, to get more of you to come involved with the show. The show is for the community, made by the community. That's what I would like to hope to achieve sometime in the future. So thank you all for listening for this week. And if you do want to give me any ideas, then please reach out to me at Assassin's Creed Let's Talk at gmail.com. No, wait. No. At. Yeah, that's right. No. Yeah. That's my email. <laughs> Assassin's Creed Let's Talk at gmail is my email. Twitter at AC Let's Talk and James at James Liquid. We're both available to answer any DMs or anything. And hopefully we'll see you all next week with a more structured episode about something that I'm very excited about.
but I won't spoil what plans we have in the works. So, thank you all, and see you next week.